I'm going to erase, well, I'll leave that X in for now. What I need to do now is solve for this X. So I'll subtract 1, u minus 1 equals 2x, and divide by 2. So I can now take out x and replace it by 1 half times u minus 1. I'll put the 1 half outside. Oh. Oh no, we're okay, yeah. So replacing x by that, we have a u to the half power, an extra one half du. So I just took out the red x and replaced it by one half u minus one. So I have a half times a half is a fourth. How do we integrate this? or addition? Uh, we can break it up across addition and subtraction, but not multiplication. So this doesn't look like one I'm familiar with, so I can't just apply calculus right away. What's the other tool you can use? Algebra. Algebra. If you're lucky, you can use geometry, but it doesn't look like a nice geometrical graph. We did some triangles and some circles and things like that, but this isn't going to be a nice geometrical shape. So I'm going to distribute right here the square root u into the u minus 1. So we get u times u to the half minus u to the 1 half du. And u to the first times u to the 1 half, that's u to the 3 halves power. And now, what rule can I use for these antiderivatives? Uh, we can break them up. We could, we could split into two, but I could just take the antiderivative of each one right now with subtraction. What's antiderivative u to the 3 halves? So u to the 5 halves is a good first guess. So we took the power, went up by 1. Well, it we really went up by 2 halves. 3 halves plus 2 halves, 5 halves. And we'll bring that fourth down. Minus u to the 1 half, that's u to the 3 halves. But there's going to be coefficients missing. So if I take derivative, I get 3 halves u to the 1 half. So I have to multiply by 2 thirds. And this one I need to multiply by 2 fifths. Be possible to combine the u's? I could recombine, I could factor out u to the 3 halves if I wanted to. Um, I don't know, if, depending on what you're doing, that may or may not be um, useful. So again, I did a guess and check. I just took what I, I added one to the power, and then you're basically multiplying by the reciprocal of the new power. So that when you would take your derivative, you get back up. Is this the final answer to the original question? No. no. What is wrong? You, you. Yes, I am wrong. No, you is wrong. So, well, it's not wrong, it's just not what we started with. So we're gonna take all the u's and go back in, <laughs> put in the x expression. So where I see u, I'm gonna replace by 2x plus one. Now, as you get expressions like this, as you're answering web work, the answer preview can be very useful. So when you hit submit, it'll give the sort of math version of what you've typed in. 
and that should match hopefully what's on your paper. So if you have a parenthesis mismatch, maybe you maybe you did something like this. That's going to be a very different value right there. So if that uh, two thirds got raised to the power also, that'll be something very different. And all that, the difference is just moving a parenthesis over a couple spots, and then you get a completely different and wrong answer. So answer preview is the first thing you should do. So look at how it's typed in. And then after that, uh, that's a little more complicated what to do next. What's that? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So if you just hit enter, it goes to uh, basically preview. It doesn't actually submit. Uh, but because, so I give you infinite attempts. Let's see. Go back. You get unlimited attempts. So these are your remaining attempts. Uh, you are cut off by the date. So you could submit an answer 100 times, and it's the same as submitting it um, as, as many other times. So there's no maximum number, but you are going to be cut off at uh, 410. So we're going to do one more problem out of this section. So this is integral sine squared x. Which one of the main, one thing to keep in mind, the powers of trig functions are written in a really weird way. The power appears kind of in the middle of the function, not at the end or the outside. So this is really the sine of x squared, and I want the antiderivative. So we're in the u substitution section. So what's a good u sub to try? Sine x. So we'll try sine x. What's the derivative of sine x? cosine x, and we're going to get a dx. Is there a cosine x anywhere? <coughs> nope. So that's a good indication that's not going to be very useful u substitution. So that's not going to help us here. That's pretty much our only calculus tool that we have. We can either guess it, and maybe it looks like the uh, derivative of a function we know about, or we can use u sub. That's about the only calculus that we can do right now for antiderivatives. What was the problem with that substitution? There's no uh, cosine anywhere. Uh, if that cosine didn't appear, if it was just uh, du equals dx, this would have been integral u squared du. Okay. But if I wrote it out, it would be integral u squared cos x well, there was no cos x, so. so if I solve for dx, I'd have a 1 over cos x du. I could do that, but again, I still won't have a, um, a cosine squared x or 1 minus cosine squared x. Uh, so this, yeah, this is all not going to be useful. All right, what happens when your calculus tools don't work? What's that? So yes, we could, exactly. so if our calculus tools don't work, what other skills do we have? Algebra. Algebra, which includes all everything you learned in pre-cal 2, all your trig identities that you didn't forget. No, you forgot most of them. Uh, but you get a cheat sheet this quarter. So there's a couple, well, there's quite a few for sine squared. The one I'm going to use 
is the power reduction. And there's also one for cos squared x. On the left, we have powers. The two uh, twos on the left side are exponents. All the twos on the right side are coefficients, right here. So the twos on the left are exponents. I try to write them intentionally extra small. And the twos on the right are written lower and bigger, and they are coefficients. Well, so what we're going to do now is make a, it's going to be a substitution uh, where we're going to swap out sine squared x for 1 minus cos 2x over 2. But we're not changing variables. So I'm not changing x's into another variable. So what I don't need to worry about is dx is not going to change. So I'm just taking out sine squared x, and I'm going to replace it by 1 minus cos 2x over 2. And now this divided by 2, you can write it as 1 half times the integral 1 minus cos 2x dx. And now I'll split this up. So this could be the, one of the first things to go on your trig identity or your uh, cheat sheet. These are some useful trig identities. Probably the u substitution should go on there too, although you're going to find, let's see, this u substitution, in my opinion, is not that useful to write down. It's more useful to just know how to do it as opposed to write it down. So the best thing you can do with u sub is just practice, really. So I'll do the integral on the left, and you do the integral on the right. So antiderivative of 1 is x. So I want you to get the antiderivative of cos 2x dx. What tr uh, calculus trick do you have to do here? Definitely can't factor out the 2. That would be highly illegal. That 2 is part of the input of the function. So we can't separate that 2. What can we do with 2x, though? Would it be illegal to do uh, u substitution then? Oh, yeah, we should do u substitution now. So this looks just like some of the other problems we had done. So what should u equal? 2x. Yep, u equals 2x. Compute du, and go ahead and finish the substitution off. You, don't have, you won't have an extra 2, so you'll need to figure out the coefficient in front of du.
So any questions on the U sub, the, the DU part, or the actual substitution? So this looks really different than what we started with. We started with uh, some sine squared, but remember, this is really the, what I have at the top of the board is really the expression we found the antiderivative of. So if you look at that form, 1 half, 1 minus cos 2x, if we take a derivative here, we're gonna get 1 half in the front, 1 half minus a fourth derivative of sine is cosine 2x times the two, so we're gonna get 2 times a fourth is minus a half. So we're going to get minus a half cos 2x. So we'll actually get the uh, same expression that we started with right up there. I strongly encourage you to take derivatives and check. But because it's not calculus one class, I'm not going to take too many derivatives this quarter. But you do need to keep your derivative practice going. So the last example problem I'll just leave for practice. It's going to be almost the same steps that we just took, but do that for cos squared x. So we're finished 5.5, and we're about to go to 5.6. So the way I usually work quizzes is we finish 5-5 Tuesday. So I'm going to try to leave three days overall uh, for your quiz. So on Friday, this could be under Friday quiz. Uh, well, it will be under Friday quiz. There's no other sections I've done so far. Yep. Depends on the quiz, uh, one to three, depending on uh, how long I think the questions would take. So there'll be some topics that just take a very long time to compute, and we'll just do one question quiz and take 30, 40 minutes, like partial fraction decomposition. And then other times, uh, things will be much faster, and maybe I'll put two or three questions on a quiz. Yep. So we're going to the next section, substitution. So we have the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Fundamental theorem of calculus two. So if big F is the antiderivative of little f, so when big F prime equals little f, we have the integral f from fx dx from a to b is big F from a to b equals f of b minus f of a. So that was the end of last quarter. We did the, it's called the definite integral. It is called definite integral because it has endpoints. It's definitely going from A to B. So we know uh, it's not just a antiderivative uh, in general. It's a specific antiderivative from A to B. So that's why we call it a definite integral. It's measuring a certain amount of area under that function. Now if we uh, bring this in with the chain rule uh, and the, the u sub that we looked at, What we don't usually write is the x equal x equal part of this. So these endpoints are in x's. They are in x's because of those parts I made in bold. Because we had an x antiderivative and our function input was x. 
So that's why these endpoints are x's. So if we have that ugly u sub integral that we started with uh, at the end of the lecture or the beginning of the lecture yesterday, we can write it as integral f u du, but it would not be a good idea. I'll do this in red. Those are not good endpoints. Why are they not good anymore? Yeah, so those are x endpoints. I need them to be in the right variable, which is u. So there are two choices you can make. One of them is you can switch them into u equals and u equals. What is the new endpoint? u equals, uh, oops, is going to be. How, what substitution do we make to get here? We said let u equal g of x. So that's how we got here. And so we know u equals g of the x value. And this u is g of the other x value. So we could change our endpoints from x's into u's. That is one option. And we keep going. We get big F u from u equals g of a, u equals g of b, which is big F of g of b. big F of G of A. So just using that uh, subtract the endpoints, we get that. There's another option. Unsubstituting, now our function eats x's instead of u's. And now we can go from x equals A to x equals b. And what do we get when we plug these in? We get big F of g of b minus F of g of a. So either way we go, we get the same final answer. So this first one, we kept, our u, we kept our u values. In the second one down here, we turned, or I should say, we unsubstituted back to x's. And you can go either way. You could change your endpoints to u's and go that route, or you could unsub back to x's. And I prefer the second way, so I'm going to much more frequently go the second way right here. So when I do a u sub, I'm going to unsub and then plug in endpoints. The other option is when you sub, you can substitute, change your endpoints into u's, and then keep going that way. There's not a wrong, well, do it another way, it'll be wrong, but there's not a wrong way of these two. So we'll do a few examples here. So the section is called substitution and area between curves. So we're going to be doing u substitution, obviously. 
What's a good choice for you? Yep, let's try x cubed plus 1. So remember, never go x. That's useless. But x is a good place to start. And then think about how much more of that expression do you want to go. So we'll try x cubed plus 1. And what is du? 3x squared dx. And that's perfect. I see a dx and a 3x squared. So what I underline is going to be du. So we have square root, <coughs> square root u, du. Now we'll go with the blue marker. And these are x values up here, negative 1 to positive 1. Because I'm switching to u's, I'm not going to write my endpoints until I'm back into x's. So I'm going to ignore the endpoints until I come back to x's. All right, antiderivative u du. We'll go and write it u to the 1 half du. This one is pretty straightforward. Add 1 to the power uh, u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds. We don't need a plus constant because we have endpoints now. So it's a definite integral. I'm going to write the vertical bar, but I'm not going to put the values until I'm back into x's. So we're about to be there. So u is x cubed plus 1. And now I can write in my x values here. We go from negative 1 to positive 1. So plug in the uh, top point first. And then the bottom one we're going to subtract when we plug this in. So 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 to the 3 halves minus 2 thirds times 0. So 2 cubed is 8. And 1 half is the square root. So we can write it as 2 squared 8 over 3. Any questions on plugging in all those values? So what I'm going to do now with the blue marker is go back through and do it the other way, where I don't ever come back to x's anymore. So let's convert the endpoints. So we'll start with the small one, negative 1. So we had negative 1 cubed plus, ooh, plus 1 is 0. So our negative 1 endpoint turned into a u value of 0. So that's our small endpoint. Now, it's a little strange. Your small endpoint won't necessarily stay small. Sometimes when your g function uh, is applied, it might make your small one actually bigger. And that's OK. So we're going to convert x equals positive 1 now. u is x cubed plus 1, which is 1 cubed plus 1, and that's 2. So we've basically left x's behind. We're not going to see x's anymore when we keep going here. So we have 2 thirds, 2 to the 3 halves minus 2 thirds times 0 to the 3 halves. So 2 cubed is 8, and 1 half, that's a square root. Do you ever require to No. It's up to you. Basically, the way you have it in black is this is a regular substitution, and then putting it in 
so I, I unsubstituted in the black. Um, so I never, I technically never really knew the U values, uh, my small and big U value. You can, you're doing the same work. So what I just circled is the small and big U value right there. If you look, you're doing the same work. It's just in different places, basically. So in the end, you're going to do the same thing. Uh, I just like to not convert endpoints and uh, plug back in my g of x function, basically. I do, but that's just personal preference. Uh, I feel like it's less steps. Or yeah, it's, a, it's up to you which way you go. So our next example. From pi over 4 to pi over 2. Oh man, cosecant squared times cotangent. That does look like one I'm used to. So I don't know the antiderivative off the top of my head. You could, so if you want to think about some algebra or some trigonometry identities, I could rewrite cosecant squared, if I'm careful, as some other trig function. I could rewrite cosecant and cotangent as sines and cosines as well. So those are some algebraic things you can do if your calculus brain isn't working. So that's if your calculus brain is not working or you can't see any calculus way to get out of this, that would be a very reasonable move to make. I do read most of what you write. So if you do start to make some substitutions, some valid trig substitutions, uh, and, well, I shouldn't use the word substitution. If you make some valid trig identity swaps, uh, especially if you get to a form that's nicer, I, I do get partial credit for that. But we are in the u-substitution section. So let's think about a u-sub. Is one of these two choices going to have a derivative that will be the other one? So what's the derivative of cotangent? It's probably going to go on your cheat sheet. So derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So the, a lot of the cos get a negative compared to the regular derivatives, uh, the regular trig derivatives. It's probably a good idea to write the six trig derivatives down on your cheat sheet. And any other derivatives that you forgot, whether it's quotient rule, you know, which, where does the minus sign go, or any of these, this is the perfect time to write them down on your cheat sheet. So we'll let u equal cotan theta derivative cotangent. So if we just didn't have that negative sign, so all we're going to do is multiply the whole thing by negative 1. So we'll bring the negative over to the du side. So we make our sub. So we have what I underlined is going to be negative du. It's a little weird because you got that negative sign creeping in. So it's negative du, and cotangent is u. So this is super easy integral. Now I'm going to not write the endpoints until I'm back to x's. So I'm going the uh, unsubstitute route. So antiderivative, I know it's u squared. And I'll check, take derivative. Negative u squared derivative is negative 2u. So I need that half power, or the half coefficient. Now we're going to come back to not x's, but thetas in this case. And now, finally, I can write my theta values back in, because I'm into my original theta variable. We have pi over 4 to pi over 2. And plugging in these, 
we have cotangent pi over two minus cotangent pi over four. Yep, cotangent squared, absolutely. So I'm not very good at cotangent values, so we'll break it down into sines and cosines. So cotangent pi over two, that is cos pi over two over sine pi over two squared minus cos pi over four sine pi over four squared. So cos pi over two is zero, sine pi over two is one. Cos pi over four and sine pi over four are the same thing. So we got minus a half times one, or net times negative one, which is positive one half. So U sub questions or unsub endpoint questions. Now, one thing you notice, the interval I went across was really small. I did that on purpose. Cosecant and cotangent have lots of vertical asymptotes. They happen to have no vertical asymptotes between pi over 4 and pi over 2. That's why I chose that really tiny interval. We'll get into uh, it call them improper integrals where we integrate over vertical asymptotes very carefully.